Good day, STAT students. So today we're going to go over uh, 8.3. We're going to create a confidence interval to estimate a population mean. So we got to figure out why are we changing over to means versus proportions. What changed from 8.2? Okay. Uh, did the data change? Uh, is the formula going to change? So on and so forth. So here's one of the problems that we have. So screen time is a serious problem for children. Okay. There's a lot of inactivity, and so. Uh, doctors and researchers are concerned about that, and so, uh, and so we want to, you know, because it might cause anxiety and tension problems and depression and stuff like that. And so, uh, so to estimate the daily mean screen time for uh, all five-year-old Americans, children, 25 five-year-olds are randomly sampled. The daily mean screen time for the 25 children is 182 minutes with a standard deviation of 28. Okay, so what we'll have to do is we'll have to take that paragraph and kind of bust it down into this piece of parts, and we'll we'll do that later. Okay, so the ultimate question is that what, we, what do we have to do? We have to create a ninety percent confidence interval. So notice here, I changed it from you know at last uh, eight point two, I was using ninety five percent. Here, I'm using ninety percent. Um, ninety percent confidence interval for the uh, daily mean screen time for all five year old children, American children. And then it says they're assuming that the daily screen time for five-year-olds is normal. So we're going to use that in the conditions, and so I'll, I'll show you here in a little bit. So again, every confidence interval has the form point estimate plus or, minus, plus or minus the margin of error. And remember, the margin of error is the critical value times your standard error. And so no matter what confidence interval you're making, it has to fit this form. And the same holds true for 8.3, okay, a confidence interval from you. So... Um, now, why are we making a confidence interval for the population mean mu and not the population proportion p? Well, the reason why that's going on is because the variable is quantitative. Screen time, right? Think about it. Screen time was somebody said, how long are you on, the on some sort of screen daily? You would answer with a number, right? And so once your variable is quantitative in a number, uh, basically now you're going to change over to mu. And uh, working with means versus a, a categorical variable <coughs> where you would work with proportions slash percentages. Okay, so here we got to think of screen time, <coughs> excuse me, as, as x for the problem, it is what varies from person to person, so that's your random variable. Okay, so the overall random variable kind of dictates then are we going to be working with means or are we going to be working with proportions slash percentages? Okay. Remember, uh, remember our formula there, uh, point estimate, okay? Plus or minus the critical value times standard error. Let's break that down into little pieces of parts, okay? Point estimate is the value of the statistic, right? And so let's see, what statistics should we start with? So since we're creating a confidence interval for the population mean, okay, probably a good place to start would be your sample mean, right? X bar, okay? And so that'll be your point estimate, the value of X bar. So here's the problem again and see if you can pick out what x bar is. So uh, hopefully you paused the, the video and said, okay, uh, it says here the daily mean screen time, sorry about that, uh, for the 25 children is 182 minutes, okay, with standard deviation 28. Hopefully you saw here that your, uh, that the screen time for 25 children on average is what, 182 minutes, okay? So what you basically have to do for every problem is that you've got to figure out what x bar is. You've got to figure out this, the standard deviation, so on and so forth. Here, x bar turns out to be 182. Okay. So if you're following along on your, on your uh, uh, slides, x bar is equal to 182 minutes here. Okay, what about the standard error? Now remember the standard error is a modification of the standard deviation of sampling the distribution of some sort. Remember back in chapter 7 that the standard deviation of sampling distribution of x bar was sigma divided by the square root of n? Okay, hopefully that sounds familiar. Well, let me remind you what sigma is. Sigma is the standard deviation of all the values of the random variable. Okay, and I put here, if you know sigma, that means you should also know mu. Okay, so if you know the population standard deviation, you should know the population mean. Because... Well, here, in, in other words, okay, sigma is a parameter. And the only way to actually know the value of, the per, of a parameter is to take what? A census. So if you took a census, what else did you know? You should know 
all any other parameter coming from that population, such as mu. Okay. So if you took a census, you should know mu, and there's no reason to create a confidence interval for it. So in other words, <clears throat> we're probably not going to take a census, right? And we're going to do what? We're going to take a random sample, right? And uh, and so. In those cases, that's when we want to create a confidence interval for mu because we don't know its exact value. And so if we don't know mu, well, guess what? We're not going to know the value of sigma. So just like when we had to modify the standard deviation of p hat, we have to modify the standard deviation of the sample distribution of x bar. Okay? So if we don't know the population standard deviation, we, what are we going to use in this place probably? Hopefully you say the sample standard deviation. So therefore, if we don't know the population standard deviation, we're going to go ahead and use a sample standard deviation. Now, we haven't seen this in a while, but that's us. Remember, we had to calculate us back in Chapter 2. Still still that, okay? Hasn't changed. Uh, still that value. <clears throat> you, know, that you know, that formula and so on and so forth. All right? So here, we have to modify the standard deviation sample distribution of x bar to so what are we going to do? Instead of using sigma, we're going to use s. Okay, and we got to call it something different. So it's now the standard error, the sample distribution of x bar, s divided by the square root of n. Unfortunately, this adds more variability to our problem. Now, why? Well, s is a statistic, and as we know, statistics vary from what sample to sample. So it's not a stable value, okay? Uh, so from one sample, one sample might produce a standard deviation, an S of 3.2. Another one might produce 3.35. Another one might produce 3.46. And so S is a, is a slightly moving target, okay? It varies from sample to sample. It's not a stable value, okay? And so as you can imagine, that adds more variability to our problem, okay? And because of this extra variability, we had to create a whole new probability distribution to account for this variability, okay? And what we call this distribution is the t-distribution. So we have to learn about the t-distribution. So the t-distribution is bell-shaped and symmetric about zero. So right there, it kind of sounds like already the standard normal distribution, okay? Um, but it, it, it does differ, okay? The probabilities depend on what we call degrees of freedom, and we're going to designate degrees of freedom as df, okay? Now, let's not panic over this. What we find out is that for the t distribution, degrees of freedom are related directly to the sample size, okay? And what we find out, uh, and, I, and this will be written down later on in the slide, but degrees of freedom uh, in section 8.3 is simply equal to n minus 1, n minus 1. Okay, now that doesn't apply for every degrees of freedom in every situation, but that's where how it applies here in 8.3. So basically, the degrees of freedom is usually a function of the sample size when using the t distribution. Okay, okay, let's move on. And like the standard normal that is unique, there is a different t distribution in every different degree of, degree of freedom. And so it's basically a family of t distributions. It's not just one t distribution, there's many of them. And there's a different one at every different degree of freedom, okay? And the t-distribution has thicker tails than the standard normal distribution. It's more spread out, okay? And so I've given you um, three different drawings here. One of the standard normal, which is the top graph. And then you got your degrees of freedom of 6 here and degrees of freedom of 2. And so this is a t-distribution. This is a different t-distribution. This is the standard normal, okay? Notice for this one right here, with degrees of freedom of 2, you get bigger area in the tails down here. Bigger areas in the tail, okay? And that means there's less stuff here. More degrees of freedom, more area in the middle, less in the tail, okay? And so on and so forth. And so what we find out is that the t-distribution gets closer and closer to the standard normal as the degrees of freedom increase. So as they get larger and larger, they get closer and closer to the standard normal, those, those, these probability distributions. And what we find out is that <clears throat> when the degrees of freedom is equal to infinity, the t distribution is equal to the standard normal, okay? And I'm going to talk more about that here in a little bit, okay? And what you really want to think of is that the t distribution, as you can see from the drawings, is what? Is basically an approximately normal distribution. 
It's an approximately normal distribution. You've heard those, that term before in Chapter 7. Well, we're going to use it again here, okay? So, um, what I would do is I would go to 8.3 right now, the module in 8.3 in Brightspace, and go print out the T table that is a PDF, okay? So I would pause this and print that uh, T table that is a PDF and print it out. Don't print out the Excel spreadsheet. That's a really long one. Print out the PDF one, okay? Uh, and so once you do that, come back to the video. All right, so hopefully you've done that. And uh, what I want to point out to you guys is that what it says here is that the standard normal distribution is the T distribution with degrees of freedom equal to infinity. So I've already stated that. And so notice at the bottom of the T table, okay? Notice this line down here. It says degrees of freedom of infinity. Do these values sound familiar? 1.645, 1.96, 2.33, 2.58? Yeah, because those are what? Those are the values for Z, the critical value for Z, okay? So when you're making, so you don't even have to memorize these values uh, for Z because they're at the bottom of what? The T table, okay? Um, and so what about the critical values for T? Well, that's all this stuff in here, okay? That's all this stuff in here, okay? So these are all critical values. Right? So let me give you an example. So let's say that we have a sample size of seven. That means we have degrees of freedom of what? Six, remember n minus one? We have, let's say we're creating a 95% confidence pool. Now look on your table, hopefully you'll see this. Degrees of freedom of six, 95% confidence level. What are we gonna use for the critical value for T? 2.477. Notice it's a, it's a little higher than the 1.96 that we would have used for the population portion P, okay? The critical value for T will always be a little higher. So what I, maybe what you wanna put on your T table right now is that whenever you're making a confidence level from you, you have to use this table. You have to use the T table. You have to get the critical values off of this table using the degrees of freedom, okay? Write that down somewhere, okay, so you don't forget. So basically what's going on here is, remember like for the empirical rule when we put 95% of the data right here in the middle, okay, and then we said that the empirical rule tells us that, uh, that basically we're going to go out 1.96 standard deviations. Well, it's the same idea, it's just that for the T distribution it's a little, going to be a little bit wider. It's going to be in, uh, for this particular degrees of freedom, okay, the degrees of freedom of 6, um, the critical value were to turn out to be 2.447. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the video and then I'm going to, uh, I'll present the rest of these uh, slides in the next one. Thank you.